Good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is Alan Morrison. Uh, I'm the Associate Dean, the Lawyer Family Associate Dean for Public Interest and Public Service here at George Washington University Law School. I also teach civil procedure and constitutional law. And I'm really pleased that so many of you are here and that I'm able to honor uh, my friend David Dorson, whom I've known for what, about 40 plus years since we first met at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York. One of my vivid memories of David is what a good softball player he was, oh, yeah. in addition to everything else that tells about. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. He was assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District for five years. He worked for uh, Senator Sam Irvin on the Watergate Special uh, Committee, uh, has been a partner in law firms, has litigated uh, many cases, and now, at this time in his life, he's decided that he's going to write a book. Uh, and so, my question, First, David is, oh, I, I forgot the most important thing about David, is he was the restaurant critic for the Washingtonian magazine <laughs> for a number of years. Uh, David, how, you, had, you had never written a book before, had you? Not one. And how about law review articles or anything like that? No. <laughs> what made you do it? Uh, I couldn't think of anything else to do. <laughs> well, uh, this was not a casual Saturday afternoon. What are we going to do for a few hours? <laughs> well, it started that way. Um, I was unsure what to do. I had been practicing law, teaching, actually teaching here. Um, wanted for the editor. I had a couple of other interests. I was tired of most of them, or they were tired of me. And I really was looking for a serious project. And uh, I must say, I didn't strike too low. Yes. <laughs> So why biography and why Henry Friend? Well, I wanted to do something I c felt I could do. I eliminated Supreme Court justices and some other subjects that I just didn't have the background for. Henry Friendly, I knew slightly. I knew, of course, his reputation. I had appeared before him as an assistant U.S. attorney. His older daughter, Joan, was a college uh, classmate of mine. I was at Harvard. She was at Radcliffe. Uh, she married a close friend of mine, Frank Goodman, who teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. And when I checked, I was surprised that there was no biography of Henry Friendly, and I considered him by far the most likely candidate for uh, a good, for a judicial biography, hopefully a good one. Were there articles about him? Oh, there were quite a few articles, yeah. Um, yes, quite a few, and uh, they were very, very helpful. Uh, Judge Randolph had one, and there were, there were quite a few articles but they were rather specialized, and he wrote a lot of articles, yeah. which I didn't know too much about, but he wrote a couple of dozen serious law review articles. So how did you get started? Where did you start? Well, I started with something I knew absolutely nothing about, was that when Friendly spent 30 years in private practice, the first part with uh, firms like Root Clark and ending up with Dewey Ballantyne, then he founded Cleary Gottlieb. And starting in 1930, he began working on Pan American and uh, eventually became a vice president and general counsel. And I started while looking. He was still at Cleary. Yes, while still at Cleary. And I started looking into that as something I was just wondering what would happen if I started looking into his private practice years. And I spoke to a couple of people. I went down to the University of uh, Miami where the Pan American papers were. I found, among other things, an oral history that no one had known about. Judge yes, Friendly. Yes, and I found altogether six of them. Five of them, I think, had never been cited anywhere in the world. And, and who did these oral histories? Well, one was by, I think, the American Jewish Congress. One was by uh, Columbia University's AIR project. The two major ones, one was commissioned by Friendly's children uh, as a sort of a weekend of interviewing by a couple of people, I think we both of us know David Epstein and his wife Ellen, and it was, uh, that was the only one that had made the rounds at all, and I interviewed all 51 of Friendly's law clerks, 50 of them in person, including Fred Davis in Paris. And when I, just talking to him, he says, by the way, I don't suppose you know that I spent an afternoon recording uh, friend, Henry Friendly, and I said no, and he says that's not surprising because you're probably the third person, the fourth person in the world to know. And he came back with the transcripts of some of it and tapes, and it was an invaluable resource. Were most of the others transcripts, or were they mostly just tapes? Uh, but either, uh, mostly transcripts. So you didn't have to start doing the work? Uh, no, but with the Fred Davis one, there were gaps in the transcript and gaps in the tape, and I had to figure them out, and there were hundreds of typos. And 
How about his papers? What did you have for, for that? Well, that well, again, it, all these things I discovered as I went along, and it turns out he had a huge collection of papers that, when he died, went to Harvard Law School, and. When I started, they had not been processed at all, and it was something of a struggle to get access to them. But there were 105 boxes, trans files of papers, that were exactly as he left them. And the, probably the most interesting part, I mean, it was all interesting correspondence, was that he had a folder for every case he worked on. And in about half of them, there were memos from one of the judges to the other two on the panel, because as far as I had been able to determine, the uh, Second Circuit was the only court, that, uh, the Federal Court of Appeals, and including the Supreme Court, that corresponded by memos. So what we had was, in many of the cases, as I said, probably close to half, at least three memos plus follow-up memos that were anywhere from a page to uh, a dozen pages written within a week of oral argument that was designed to explain the views of the writing judge to the other two members of the panel, maybe convince him or her of the validity of the position. So it was a unique resource, absolutely reliable because it was done at the time with a view to furthering the resolution of the case. So it was just an amazing resource and one of the most valuable. And it was tempting to cite it, uh, them a lot, but I, you know, I had to restrain myself because they were somewhat technical and there were just so many different sources. Did he have draft opinions in his case files too? Yes, uh, he wrote his opinions longhand. Uh, in private practice, he dictated between two secretaries, one would type and one would transcribe. He was a legend at Clary Gottlieb for having done that. Yeah, he, he's nonstop. So, but when he went to the government as a, a judge, he found there was only one secretary. And therefore, he couldn't dictate because of what would he do the rest of the time. So he started, he learned to write opinions longhand. And he just wrote them out with two pads, uh, letter-sized, white-lined pads. One started friendly J, and he started writing, this case is about, and then there'd be footnote one, and you'd go to the other pad, footnote one, and fill it in, and then you'd go back and you'd just cite. A big footnoter? A moderate footnoter. But he remembered cases. He had what many call a photographic memory. I, I just couldn't say that with a, you know, with, as a positive. But he remembered not only the names of cases, but frequently the volume and citation. And, you know, and a couple of the clerks, actually more than a couple, said, I'm not sure he needed us. I really don't know why he wanted clerks. It just crowded things up. And yet they were all, most of them said they were very busy. And they, when I met them decades later, they had trouble telling me why they were busy in some cases. So were these folders thick or thin? Or well, pardon, the folders were sometimes empty to, and sometimes thick, but most of them were like a quarter of an inch thick with a few memos. Some, uh, maybe, some of them had draft opinions, longhand. Some had the typewritten version because he would give the draft to the typist, to his, to his secretary, would type them up, and usually she would just hand up to the triple space uh, drafts to the law clerk to fill in the blanks, make whatever suggestions, and uh, uh, the friendly would see them again, but not spend much time on them. Did he save the briefs in any of the cases? Not in those no, folders. You to them, but you had to go oh, oh, yeah. I, I, one of the things I was trying to do was f find out what, in, in uh, Richard Posner's phrase, value added, friendly provided. So I, the only way really to accomplish that was to go and read briefs. And I went to New York, where I, either the, uh, mostly at the archives, because there I could get the record on appeal as well as the briefs, and sometimes to the association of the bar, which just had the briefs, and read them and compared them to the opinion. Where are the archives in the Second Circuit? Well, they, the, the actual documents are in Missouri, but it's on Vesey Street and Houston in, is where I had to go to the New York so office. Yeah, I, had to, I could order 10 at a time. And I read something like 95 sets of briefs and listened to a number of oral arguments so I could see to what extent Friendly followed the briefs. And the astonishing thing was, maybe not astonishing, is that he rarely did. Uh, the briefs, he f you, were usually... Yeah, the quality of the briefs are... It's both. No, it, is, it is both. It is bo he, was, he, used to, he wrote memos to his colleagues saying, another set of wretched briefs filed in this case, or I mean, th you know, just caustic stuff. 
Did he ever say, say the briefs were good? A couple of times, yes, a number of times. Actually, he did in his opinion say that a number of times. And I, I, I uh, sort of searched for the word superb and some other things that I found once he said a brief was superb. But he was very complimentary and he was very complimentary to the other judges about his law clerks when they contributed. Because one thing he really liked, even though he was a very tough taskmaster and could be very, very harsh with the clerks, was when they came up with a good idea, he was delighted, excited, and he would send notes to the other two judges, my clerk so-and-so came up with this, and I think it's a great idea, and, and he would do things like that. He really wanted his clerks to do well. I don't think he gave the best atmosphere, because there was a lot of intimidation and um, haste, you know, and, and uh, impatience, but uh, he really wanted his clerks to do well. Did you have an opportunity to talk with family members and friends? Uh, yes, um, I talked, uh, in one case I talked to a college classmate of Henry Friendly's who was 106 when I interviewed him <laughs> and I quoted him in the book. Uh, he said that Friendly was considered not only the smartest member of his, our class but the smartest member of, of Harvard College, t period. And he gave me some other story, another story which I used. Yes, I talked to his um, he had three children, two daughters, both of whom I spoke to. The son died. I spoke to the widow, uh, his widow. I spoke many, many times. There was some resistance. Um, they, uh, actually, one of the biggest problems, uh, I'll mention it now, that I found when I started looking into Henry Friendly's personal life was that he played strong favorites among his children. He made it very clear to all his children and to some other people that he greatly loved and admired his daughter Joan, but didn't have quite the same relationship with his other two children. And it was very painful for the daughter Ellen, who was a wonderful woman, a teacher, and for his son, who was di died, and I spoke to his widow, and she really didn't want to even talk about their relationship. And Joan, who was a middle child, a uh, contemporary of mine, we were in college together, and a remarkable person. She has a PhD in education, was the ombudsman of the University of Pennsylvania, and a remarkable person. But I felt that it's not right for, for parents to play favorites and make it known that they're playing favorites. And that was probably my biggest criticism of Henry Friendly that he just, it, he just, it was so obvious. I mean, for example, uh, he fought, when he died, he committed suicide, as most, many of you know, and he wrote three suicide notes. One was to his housekeeper, you know, telling her what to do and not to go into the bedroom where he'd take, taken pills. One to his law clerks to fill him in on what they should do. And the third one was to Joan and not to the other two children. So there are many examples like this, and one of the problems I had in experiences I was, was you know, how do you talk about this? How do you deal with these things? How do you avoid, you, you don't want to whitewash it, but you don't want to make it uh, sound like it was an obsession of the author. So there were a lot of instances like that, and that was one of the hardest things to do, was to try to be fair and accurate, you had dignity and balance, and you know, you never know whether you succeed. Judge Friendly was a history student at Harvard. Yes. And he almost became a historian. Uh, yes. What swayed him to, to go, cause him to change his path? Well, he was a hist history major and loved history, really just loved it. And then uh, he started taking courses in medieval history, mostly medieval England, with Charles McElwain, the scholar, the great scholar of that period. And he decided in his senior year that rather than go to law school, which was what was contemplated, he would stay on and join the history department. And as Friendly said in one of his oral histories, that exactly, wasn't exactly the best news my parents heard that week. <laughs> and interestingly enough, his parents were friendly with Julian Mack, who was a judge, a Court of Appeals judge, uh, I think on the Commerce Clause, and then he went to the Second Circuit. 
and they contacted him and he said there's just one person to talk to your son and that's Felix Frankfurter so before it's a good start, it's a good start right <laughs> and before he got to law school before he got to law school and before he got to law school he met with Felix Frankfurter who convinced him to go to law school for a year and his logic was look your paper that you just told me about about the church and state in 11th century England there was a lot of law there so you really couldn't hurt you too much to know a little law so why don't you spend a year if you don't like it you can always go back to history to th then with a little bit better background if you do like it you can decide what you want to do and he did and he did you did he ever look back on it? oh I think he did yes um, because I think he would have given up everything for history and uh, several times Harvard Law School tried to get him back to teach there and, they, uh, and Frankfurter and Brandeis wanted him to go to either teach or go to a government and Friendly was not prepared to make the financial sacrifice for the law. Finances? finances and you know, I think it was largely a matter of finances because I think he's, he wanted to have his uh, family uh, you know well off and balancing one legal job for another didn't excite him as much as balancing a history position with a legal job so I think his, his feeling was as long as I'm going to be in the law I might as well do it in a prestigious firm doing th things and making good money of course law schools weren't paying nearly as much as then, but then they weren't charging as much as tuition. That's so true. And, I went to law school. And, 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 and they don't have the prestige. Now, yeah. That's right. And, and, and professors just didn't have the prestige also. It was not considered a plum to teach at Harvard the way it is now or any good law school. Do you think that Judge Friendly would have been a good teacher? No. <laughs> That's a good answer. He, um, why? Why? Because I, th several reasons. One, I think he, w he first he mumbled a lot. I mean, he was. Uh, clerks would tell me, you know, he. One clerk, I can't remember who it was, said he walked in and, as usual, friendly was in the middle of a sentence, and he said to Judge Friendly, more gravely than most clerks, and Judge, by the way, could you tell me the sentence that came before the one you're telling me now? <laughs> he also was so quick that he would get impatient with people who were not up to his level, and of course. You could argue that no one was of his level, or very few. And third, he really, you know, I, I, one thing, I, you know, I, I get these uh, in, uh, insights. He was talking to, I was talking to his daughter-in-law, and she said, I once went on a long drive to me, with, uh, with me, and I had the feeling he wasn't talking down to me. And this, this, another woman who was not a lawyer said the same thing. And then I realized that was because Friendly didn't care about who his audience was, and he didn't care whether they understood or not. He was just talking the usual way, just like in a moot court when he berated a student for something. He had only one way to practice law, and he had only one level on which to speak. He spoke to his grandchildren, and he called a 13-year-old. He came back to his office and told the secretary about a 13-year-old that he was talking to. Grandchild, she was shallow. Well, all 13-year-olds are shallow. <laughs> and I think Friendly would have been a very bad teacher, and I don't think he would have liked it, because I think the reaction of the students would have been one of utter bewilderment. I mean, they are bewildered enough at Harvard, but with Henry Friendly, they would have been really bewildered. And that would have been, you think, worse at the law school than in the history department? Yes, I think so, because I think, I think in, teach, in teaching history, you can lecture and read stuff, and all that and I think at law you're, in those days you know, the Langdell had already had the influence of this where you're supposed to use a Socratic method and I just don't think he would have been very susceptible to it although he liked it he did he loved this Socratic method and praised it but I just don't think that he would have been very good running the show uh, as a Socratic teacher. Was he an active participant in class at law school or could you, did you find anybody to tell you about that? I have no idea that I, I never got to speak to one of his law school classmates, certainly not a professor of his, yeah. and I just don't know. Now, we got a clerkship with Justice Brandeis. Was yes. That Justice Frankfurter, or yeah, that was just Professor Frankfurter. Yes, he picked, his, uh, picked Brandeis. And, and what kind of influence did that have on, on Frederick? 
Well, I think he, in some senses, a lot. I mean, he became very much dedicated with, through both Frankfurter and Brandeis and McElwain to textualism in a sense uh, of paying great attention to the words that are written, great attention to the, what the words meant at the time. And I think this was something that he followed throughout his career, and that was very influential. Also, he learned from Brandeis the respect for the facts. And even when he was getting quite elderly, uh, and let, you know, spent a little less time on the briefs and let the clerks do a little bit more editing, he always insisted, no matter what, that he write the statement of facts for himself. So I think the statement of proceedings below as well as the facts. It's funny, I never thought of that. I have no idea, actually, but he, uh, I think probably, because I think the proceedings below weren't terribly complicated in most of these cases. So you mentioned that he was a, a, a textualist. Uh, you have a quote in the book uh, in which he's quoting Judge Leonard Hand about the wrong way to read a text. Yes. Uh, let me quote it to you here. Uh, just look at that today. Sure. Leonard Hand said, there's no surer way to misread any document than to read it literally. Uh, and apparently he liked to refer to that as well as the, the off-site admonition as one of the surest indices of a mature and developed jurisprudence not to make a fortress out of the dictionary. Okay, okay. Uh, let me say something that I, I, I discovered and it took me years to realize. And I got it from reading the briefs and just thinking about the cases. And that is Friendly had a, a slew of approaches. Some were textualist, mostly purposivist. Uh, and I, I'll give you a couple of examples in a second. And he picked the one, to a surprising extent, that satisfied him in the way he wanted to come out with the case. In other words, he was a, what I call a uh, small bore activist. He would look at a case and say, what makes the most sense for this case to come out a certain way? And, he would, and then he would find a philosophy or find an approach that would accomplish that. So that at times he, was, he would say that when he didn't want to follow the words. Other times he would have to go on with McElwain and all that with when he did want to follow the world, words. So that he, to a great extent, was a, a judicial activist, but it was not the kind of you know, activism that, you, that people march in the streets about. He cared about the law. He wanted the result to fit in with the law. And if he, he would use any way he could, I mean that's a slight exaggeration, but we know each other, we know I exaggerate, so uh, he would use whatever way he could to come out that way, whether it meant totally registering the briefs. In one libel case, uh, Cianci uh, versus New Times, the uh, Cianci's lawyer, who was a plaintiff, and it's an interesting story which is in there, but he, uh, he gave up the, the main point he had on which to win, namely that he conceded that the statement in the magazine was opinion. Well, Friendly just ignored that. I mean, he just and he, he reversed the district judge on a ground not only that was not argued, but that was conceded. And he just didn't mention that. In another case, he would just, for example, in tax cases, he, he was something there of a literalist or textualist. And when he did, that's because he got reverse nine nothing in a case where he wasn't in his second year. When he came up against a situation where there was no way to reconcile the language with the sensible result, for example, uh, a certain provision applied to individuals, corporations, everything you can think of, trust, the state, everything except partnerships. And it was obviously an, an oversight. So in those situations, tax cases friendly would just bring out or retrieve the absurdity doctrine, which said that if a result is absurd and couldn't possibly have been what the legislature intended, uh, you can ignore the language. And he did that something like five times in tax cases. I think one other case in the Court of Appeals while he was there cited the absurdity doctrine. So he would find ways, creative, that were somewhat daring. Sometimes he just, in one case, had to come out in a sensible way. 
sensible because you thought the facts may put you in one direction rather than the other? Well, sensible sometimes that and sometimes in the situation I've just given you, that it made absolutely no sense to omit partnership. It was, a, it was it, the word partnership, it was a cross-reference to a cross-reference. So it's easier to say that it was an oversight. But he did things like that, and once in one case, uh, the only one I can really think of, it involved Mario Biaggi, who was the running for mayor and who was something of a, uh, well, he was not the nicest person or the most honorable person, let's say. And he, a newspaper story said that he had pleaded the Fifth Amendment in the, in the grand jury about his personal finances. And the district judge, and then there were motions made to release the uh, tra grand jury transcript, which was a little uh, procedurally it was a little complicated. And the district judge said, I'm going to release them. Biagi's obviously making the motion with the expectation it will be denied, and that's just, I'm not going to do it. And Henry Friendly told his clerk, Fred Davis, that uh, um, we're reversing. And then he said to Fred Davis, while he's writing the opinion, by the way, Fred, could you get me a copy of the grand jury minutes? Which he hadn't had. And he reads the minutes, and he walks out and says, Fred, we're reversing. And it was just that, the opinion that he wrote for two to one, was de really devoid of any authority. Neither his opinion nor the dissenting opinion by Judge Hayes cited any authority. And Friendly himself, 18 months earlier, had decided a case that was ex directly opposite his position, in which he said Rule 6E of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure are the extent to which you can allow, well it was not exactly the same case, but it was the same concept of rules, oh, but you know, he, he started saying with the, uh, the view that, that 6E is, is exhaustive and none of the provisions applied, and he ended up saying, asterisk, there's an, an exception for some situations in this case, but I'm not going to tell you how broad it is, and this case cannot be cited ever again by anybody, or words to that effect. Well, it has been enough. <laughs> I, yeah, no, that, that's well, enough. Subsequently, uh, the uh, I was the counsel in a couple of the cases right. in which grand jury access, first for the Rosenbergs, the, the Hisses, and most recently Dixon's grand jury testimony. Most people didn't even know that Dixon had testified before the grand jury after Watergate. And uh, John Dean called me one day, a former client of yours as well, uh, to tell me about it. And I said, well, my old office of public citizen would be glad to help you out. And sure enough, Judge Lamberth has ruled that, the, that there is a historic exception for grand jury. And, uh, so it's now pretty well ingrained, but it all began with Mario Biaggi, and if you look at the rule, it doesn't provide a lot of... It doesn't, no, there, there, there's clearly no basis for doing it, and it took 25 years for the Second Circuit to recognize that as a possible exception, and Friendly just said, walked into his office, we're affirming, walks out of his office, we're reversing. That was the only one of over a thousand. The After you saw the transcript. The, the facts. Only, oh, yeah, the facts. Only, the only case I can think of where he did something like that, although he did, you know, you know, sometimes was rather creative. Tell us about his private practice before he... Okay. He, he never went to work for the government, did he? No. No, he spent 31 years between the two firms. Uh, he started in 1930 working for um, Pan American and working directly with Juan Tripp, who he thought was one of the worst boss he ever had because he, you know, he just, you know, he would call meetings at 7 p.m. and never find you and you and never get you were there and uh, you know, ration information or flood the board with information. But he gradually worked himself up. So as I said, he was. Uh, Vice President and um, General Counsel. And much of his work, especially in the late 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, because he took Pan American as a client, his client with him when he went to Cleary Gottlieb, even though he was not the quote unquote originating partner, were root cases for uh, Pan American. And, which, and the big ones were involved in deciding whether TWA or anybody else would be able to compete internationally across the Atlantic and then it was there was another battle over the Pacific and another battle in Latin America and there was one case which I describe in some length that had 14,000 page transcript which I had to read 
describing how the case was handled and Friendly was a very good cross-examiner he knew more than anyone in the room he could he was just a, a, a brilliant but these were administrative agents right. before the, what was then the CAB? that's correct and if no jury I don't know how he would have done before a jury but uh, he certainly was effective and that was a large part of his practice that's kind of odd, isn't it, for, for New York law firms, if you were in a New York law firm, yeah. to have a very heavy administrative law caseload, much more expected of a Washington law firm. That's right, but it just worked out that way. And uh, later as a judge, uh, when he was on the Second Circuit, friendly complained that all the good cases come to the D.C. Circuit because he wanted more administrative law cases. And he resented the fact that D.C. Circuit got all these great administrative law cases. But what was it, one, one thing that's interesting is when in, on one of these oral histories, in fact, I think on both oral histories, he said one of the reasons he was unhappy with private practice at the end, and maybe for a longer time, not only the detail and all that, which, some of which he liked, was because, as he said, the results bore little relationship to the input and the quality of advocacy. And he felt that he just felt totally frustrated by working so hard to get a great brief and all that, and then, boom, the, uh, the, the hearing examiner and then the CAB rules against him. What I realized, again, in one of these insights that was slow in coming, I confess, was that that's exactly what Friendly did when he took the bench. He would help the people who needed help, and he, would, he didn't care about the quality of the advocacy. So it's somewhat ironic that he wanted to get out of private practice to be a judge so that he could do the same thing that got him out of private practice. And it was true. He just would create ideas. And some, in one case, it was a rather poor brief, and he was remanding. And he said, well, in order that we don't waste the time of the district judge, the court's going to spend a few moments discussing the theory on remand to see whether it's worth remanding. And then he laid out brilliantly, far better than the uh, appellant, exactly what, the other, what he had to prove to win the case. And he did that several times as a way of helping the more poorly represented person. It's interesting, you, you talk about the difference between what his practice was like uh, as a practicing lawyer and what, his, what the caseload was on the bench. One of the things that people said was when he went to the bench, oh, here's a real practicing lawyer, he'll get on the bench. But his experience was quite different in terms of what he did in private practice versus what he did on the bench in terms of the case law. Well, 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 I think that's true of many judges even, uh, today and, and then that they, you know, unless you're, you practice extensively criminal law and a few other general practice, professors may know only a couple of subjects. Um, and Friendly basically knew administrative law and a couple of things. And I remember reading the first hundred opinions in putting the bankruptcy, cr a criminal law, admiralty. And when I was done, I think it was something like 12 out of 100 that he had direct experience in the field while in private practice. And Milton Grossman, who's here, told me that he never saw, for his first clerk, that he never saw Friendly act as though he was at sea in any of these fields about which he knew nothing in private practice. He just looked at it, read it, and then he just you know, he approached it as though he was a lifelong uh, expert. So could we go back to the opinion writing? Sure. How did that, how, did, did he discuss these uh, opinions with his clerks uh, before he wrote them, or did he just go down, sit down and do them? Well, we'll have a few clerks here to talk about it, but uh, as I understand it, he would, uh, read the briefs when they all came in, put them aside. The clerks did not prepare voting memos. Uh, he had a short discussion with them before the oral argument. They'd come back from oral argument. Friendly would, Friendly would try to dictate, he did dictate, but these voting memos the same day if possible and get them out as he once told one of the clerks so the other judges wouldn't do something stupid. Uh, and um, did, he, did he revise these memos or basically? No, I, I don't think I ever saw a revised memo. Pretty basic. I, I mean, they probably, I mean, and I don't remember anyone talking about a revised memo. He would just dictate them in final and they read like they had so been edited. The secretary took uh, shorthand. Yeah. He didn't have a machine or anything? No, no, in shorthand, just sitting there and dictating it off. And the, the clerks were encouraged to butt in, but I don't think they ever did, is from what I heard. And he would just give, and actually John Newman, who's uh, served with him on the Second Circuit, 
told me he, he and his colleagues called them draft opinions, these voting memos, because they were generally more sophisticated, more complicated, better organized than uh, the others. And one thing I, I just mentioned, which I had, and that is Judge Friendly loved dicta. He, made a, he wrote a lot of dicta, and again, he was, it was part of an educational process, uh, and he would sometimes just write, when, usually when no one had suggested it, uh, you know, the case on a public figure right after Sullivan, the parties had not argued any of the applicability of Sullivan, of Sullivan, partly because it hadn't been decided when they wrote their main briefs, and they didn't file supplemental briefs. So Friendly said, well, if the case was somewhat different, we might have to decide the question of public figure, and then he gave a brilliant one-paragraph explanation why public figures should be treated the same as public officials, starting with, if a public official uh, is accused of uh, taking a bribe, actual malice is required. But what if the bribe was paid by his opponent? Is there a different standard? That can't be. And what are they both talking about during the campaign of public issue? They have to have the same standard. And then he just said, obviously certain public figure for certain uh, areas have to have the same standard of, that protects the media as the public official. And he just did this. I mean, there was no, nothing said. I hadn't found anything on the subject, written on the subject, certainly not judicially, before Judge Friendly uh, wrote that paragraph. The popular press in particular likes to label judges in particular, justices of the Supreme Court, as liberals, conservative, middle of the roaders, pragmatists, literalists. Uh, how would you describe Judge Friendly? And, and if he were sitting on the Supreme Court today, where would he be in the, in the the well, let me say this. When I was an assistant U.S. attorney, for, but I was for five years in the criminal division, we really wanted to have Friendly on, uh, on the panel, both because he was smart and we thought we had the merits, but because we thought he was conservative and uh, a judge that would see our way of handling things. I, he was, his writings were very conservative. Um, constitutionally habeas corpus. His opinions a little bit, somewhat less so. And I took a, a quick, uh, not a quick, I took all the opinions, well one of the problems in grading or rating or describing a, a judge on the Court of Appeals is that unlike the Supreme Court they're dealing with a different body of cases. So how do you deal with that when you try to compare judges? What I did was I took all the decisions that were two to one on the grounds they were closer cases where there was an issue between the, uh, among the judges and they knew there was a disagreement and I rated Henry Friendly compared to the other judges. He came out much more liberal. Something like two-thirds of his votes, in a, in a, whether it was a two or the one, was on the, were on the side of the defendant. Completely shattering my perception of him. And so he, he was you know, I, I could get into it more than I do in the book, but that to me was a, a startling discovery. Uh, on the Supreme Court, I think he would be a, what we call a swing voter. Uh, he was, you know, he was a, he was a moderate, really. He was a Republican, but in the days when there were moderate Republicans, which would probably get maybe that he would never get appointed today. Um, but I think he. No, he would, I think he, as uh, again, uh, Judge Randolph pointed out, that Judge Friendly had written a draft opinion on the abortion issue, on an abortion case which never got published because it became moot, in which Judge Friendly took the position as a matter of constitutional law that there was no right to an abortion, although expressed some sympathy for uh, abortion, but not as a constitutional matter. On other issues, he was more liberal and some issues conservative. I think he would, it would have depended a lot on the case. And I, one thing I tried to do is to see if I could come up with a sort of an overall philosophy that took into account all of this, and I couldn't. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I just, it's, it's just, I just couldn't do it. I, I just couldn't figure out whether there was a general overall overarching philosophy. Maybe you didn't have it overall. It may not be your 
Walt, well, I, 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 I just couldn't say. Did anyone suggest that he had one? No. I know he was asked me why I didn't say that whether there was one, which is also pleasing. But uh, no, I, I just don't, I just couldn't find anything that tied together because he was so pragmatic that at times he would be unpragmatic. And in one case involving a defendant who found out years after his conviction, a guy named Selena, Paul John Selena, that his lawyer representing him wasn't in fact admitted to the bar. And it was clear to everyone, undisputed, that this man was as guilty as could be imagined. I think he confessed they had, they didn't have DA fingerprints, they had a camera when he robbed the bank, they had everything. And Judge Fenley found the only ground, I think, on which he could reverse, or did reverse, I, I don't want to make it sound that premeditated, and that is that under the law as it stood in 1791 when the Sixth Amendment was passed, or adopted, a counsel meant a person duly admitted to the bar. And since it was, he was not counsel, that was essentially the end of the matter. So he, even in his pragmatic way, or opportunistic way to take a slightly less uh, to put a, maybe the wrong spin, he would use the, the absurdity doctrine, originalism, he would use just about anything that he thought was fair, but also had a, a, a legal basis. Did you find any scoops? Ah, uh, scoops, scoops. Well, the closest... Prizes. Well, no, scoops is a good word. Uh, I mean, if you could think of a scoop in a book about Friendly, it's, it's, it's a little hard for me, but the, probably the most interesting thing of that sort was when I was talking to Walter Hellestein, one of his clerks, and the clerk who was his clerk during the uh, Pentagon Papers case, uh, the paper, no, when it got to the Supreme Court, there were two cases, one from D.C. Circuit and one from the Second Circuit, and the Second Circuit favored the government and Judge Friendly was the chief judge of that. And Judge Friendly, the, the order, whoever wrote it, was just a one, long one sentence order saying it's to be remanded to Judge Murray Gerfine for to discover whether there are any violations of secrecy or things like that. And that was it. And there was no opinion written. Was Friendly on the panel? Oh, he was, he was on Bonk. It was on Sorry. Bonk from the, the, uh, one of the very, very, very rare cases in the Second Circuit that was on Bonk from the beginning. It still is fairly rare. Yes, oh yeah. And um, Walter Hellestein told me, he said, I remember there was a memo that Judge Friendly wrote on the substance of the Pentagon Papers case. And I remember that he put the memo into an envelope addressed to Justice John Marshall Harlan and mailed it which is a very questionable thing to do for a judge on an intermediate court to send a memo to the Supreme Court Justice that, um, by the way, if you want to affirm, which I wish you would, here's the way to do it. Uh, no. You have that, the memo you found? I found the memo. It took a while because it had been misfiled, and I found it, and I showed it to Judge uh, Feinberg, Wilfred Feinberg, who was the only living judge on the panel, he didn't recognize it. We went to his file and it wasn't in it. And the thing said make three copies on the original or the draft. So I said you know, th th that corroborated Walter Hellerstein's story, but I wasn't satisfied, so I went to Princeton to look at Harlan's papers and I talked to two of the three Harlan clerks. And no, I couldn't find any sign of that memo or any of the clerks, either of the clerks I spoke to, uh, including one friendly clerk, former friendly clerk, who remembered it. So I just sort of laid it out. But it was a very interesting thing. Um, you know, it would have, you know, Did he know Harlan? Were they on the Second Circuit at all? Oh, no, they, they were partners together. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that. I'm yes. glad you okay. raised that. But they were partners together. And in fact, when Friendly went to the firm in 1928, Harlan was there and they worked closely together on at least one major case and remained close friends all their lives. Very close friends and Harlan preceded them on the Second Circuit. But uh, no, they were very close friends. Were there particular areas of law that he was more interested in than others? And did he seek those out and try to influence them? Well, uh, he liked complex litigation. He liked it, and probably the two areas were administrative law and securities law. 
and he was, I'd say he had an impact in a surprisingly large number of areas, an astonishing number. And uh, you know, again, I talk about them. But I would say the one area that he had the greatest impact was securities law. And he just wrote a lot of opinions. And there was one article written on him, his reputation and then securities law and things like that. And again, to tell another one of these stories, I was again trying to figure out you know, what, how friendly came out. And I had all these opinions and summarized. I summarized every one of his thousand opinions. And I started looking at them, and I said, well, what about uh, this situation? What about that? And I started looking at cases where Judge Friendly reversed the district court judge. I mean, I looked at the cases reaffirmed. I looked at the cases. And I looked at them. And then I said, well, there are 14. And it was, I said, gee, there are 12 to 2 where he reversed in favor of the defendant. Then I looked at those two. I'm actually making this sound a little bit more dramatic than it was, but just excuse me. Uh, I looked at those two, and they were both cases where the investor, the plaintiff, was sophisticated. So in the 12 cases where Judge Friendly reversed a district judge in a suit by an unsophisticated plaintiff investor against a company or a brokerage house, in every single one of them, he voted to reverse, wrote an opinion to reverse the district judge in favor of the plaintiff. Uh, they were just the district in, judge was in favor of the plaintiff? No, no, and everyone, they were in favor of the defendant. So he, he could arguably be seen as a pro-plaintiff from that, from that standard, and again, it, it, I, I try to find meaningful standards, he was very, very pro-plaintiff pro in securities cases, and one of the reasons was, was that he loved to invest himself. And I spoke to a couple of the secretaries who said that he would make calls frequently to his broker and things like that. So it, was, it's, again, it's, it sort of fits together in a, in, a, in a way that... Your discussion of the IDS case in there, when he, when he had real doubts about what, whether the players understood anything about what was going on. Yeah. Nice uh, you can, you, you, I want to go back to the title of your book. Yes. Uh, the uh, greatest jurist of the... Big judges, judges there, right. Obviously, exclude terming it literally for judges as opposed to justices. Well, I, I didn't mean it that way. Uh. <laughs> uh, that's the first question. Uh, so you thought he was the greatest judge yeah. ever. <laughs> well, then let me say this. It's, it's, you know, when you write a book, uh, you know, I, I, these things were all new. I really believe that, but on the other hand, I, and I read a lot of biographies and read a lot of cases, you know, if I had to debate no, again, this is what I'm talking about is after Frankfurter, after Harlan. Um, I think I, I think I'm right. Uh, would I want to debate I it? So. What? I hope, I so. hope so. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I hope so because I want to be right. Yeah. But um, I really believe that, and I just don't know who would be the strongest competition. There were excellent court of appeals judges like Wisdom and others that he admired and liked. Uh, I did not include uh, Richard Posner, who overlapped with him four years. Uh, Judge uh, Trainer, uh, somebody he admired, but I just don't. I read a lot of his opinions for that reason. I just don't. I can't think of anybody who would be greater. I have to. The only I would not exclude Supreme Court justices, but I would exclude trial judges. Um, who knows whether Judge uh, Friendly was better than Judge Weinfeld or some other judges? That I. I I, I didn't want to have a footnote to my title. <laughs>
November of my last year of law school. And to give you an idea of how things changed, I only applied to, uh, as I recall, three judges, maybe four, but it, um, it was Carl McGowan, uh, Judge Leventhal on the DC Circuit, and Henry Friendly. I think they're the only three I applied to. And had gotten an offer from uh, Judge McGowan and then got a letter from Henry Friendly, not a telephone call, or there was no immediacy to it. And, uh, and obviously I uh, was pleased and accepted it and then wrote apologies to Judge McGowan and got a letter back which I just looked at uh, this afternoon in, in the big file saying, you made the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> Similar for you, Judge Crawford? Uh, in, yes, in many ways, although by the time... Uh, in, yes, in many ways, although by the time my year came we were not picking that we were not uh, that late. We were in the spring of the second year. Uh, it was again a process that uh, went over a period of time. I had an interview with Judge Friendly scheduled for I think May, and I had an interview with Judge uh, Wilkie and Judge Leventhal for I think April, maybe early April. And uh, another thing that was very different is people, at least. I did not have any idea what the judicial philosophies were of the judges I was applying to. I not, there was no way to Google people, and if you didn't have their cases in the casebook, you didn't know. So I went to my interview with Judge Leventhal, who was a very well-known um, 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 hard look uh, um, judge with respect to administrative law. And he saw I had a lot of economics, and he said, oh, this is good, will you be able to uh, determine whether the economic analysis of the agencies were, was, were correct or not. And I said, well, I thought I could, but I didn't think that was appropriate for, for a judge, and I did not get an offer from <laughs> Judge Leventhal. Um, I did get a, an offer from Judge Wilkie, and I, I said, um, well, uh, Judge Friendly has me coming you know, a month from now, and Judge Wilkie said, oh, no problem, go ahead. Um, and I interviewed with Judge uh, uh, Friendly, and uh, uh, got the job, and Judge Wilkie also sent me. Ex maybe they had a stock letter in the DC Circuit. <laughs> they said you made the right choice. I would, <laughs> I would have done that too. Mm. Um, as far as how I got the job, I really have no idea. I, um, I remember speaking to Todd Rakoff, who was two years ahead of me, and who's now uh, associate dean at Harvard. Um, I know that in the year that Rob Weiner and I were clerking, the judge said call your various law schools and find out who the best people are. And I called uh, the Harvard Law School and they said, John Roberts, he's the right guy. So I told Judge Friendly, John Roberts is the right guy and John, Ro John Roberts got the clerkship. So mm -hmm. there you have it. Yeah. Well, I, I was, I guess, between uh, Ray and Merrick and uh, uh, sort of an anomaly, I think. I Anomalous in the first respect in that I came from a school other than uh, Harvard, Columbia, Yale, or Penn. Uh, I came from the University of Texas, and um, I uh, had applied, I think, in about September. It turns out Judge Friendly had already selected one of his clerks for the next year and apparently was on the verge of making a second offer when uh, my letter came in, and it just so happened that one of the clerks who was there I had known in college, and he took the letter in and showed it to Judge Friendly. And Judge Friendly called uh, Charles Allen Wright, who was a professor that he knew at Texas, and uh, uh, asked Wright about me. And shortly after his conversation with Wright, I get a call, and it's Judge Friendly on the line. And he said, well, I'm about to select my clerks. Uh, can you come in this afternoon? Well, you know, I don't know where he thought Texas was. On the other side of the caucus or something, and I said, well, this afternoon it would be a little difficult, but uh, anytime after this afternoon, all right, come tomorrow. So that's, this was going to be a Saturday. He said, just come up to my apartment. I did. Uh, and he, uh, he met with me in, in his library, and we chatted for a while, and he offered me the job on the spot. And I went back to Texas uh, rather shell-shocked by it. I later discovered that, um, and didn't know this at the time, but I, I didn't know uh, Professor Wright all that well. I had taken his course and, and um, uh, had interacted with him a little bit, but mostly um, I had been on the touch football team that he coached. As he was uh, a fanatical football fan, 
one reason that he stayed in Texas for so long, I think. He wanted to see good quality college football. And uh, touch football at Texas was a huge deal. And Professor Wright, every year, had the team that won the university-wide championship. And he wanted that team to be good. And it, the rules were such that a little scrawny, speedy guy like me was actually at an advantage. So I uh, think, at the end, that the reason I got the clerkship was I was good at touch football. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we heard in the first session that um, Friendly uh, wrote his own drafts, and at least uh, some of the clerks sort of felt like he didn't really need clerks. Um, was that your impression, that, that uh, you were superfluous, or what, what is it that kept uh, you busy? No, I never had that. I have to say that uh, I have read this book, and I've actually read it almost twice, and, and Henry Friendly is just so lucky to have David Dorson. This is one of the best uh, judicial biographies, may, the best that I've ever read. So my hats off to you, Dave. Uh, yeah, he, he did. He wrote all his drafts, um, and there were exceptions. He told me early in my clerkship, I don't know whether he shared this with you, but he, he said to me, every time I, ha I allow a clerk to do a draft opinion for me, I get in trouble. <laughs> so, at, at, off, he went off to the Panama Canal uh, for a vacation in March of 1970 when I was clerking for him. And I got a note, and he said, if you find time hanging heavy, why don't you try your hand at drafting? And this is one of these draft dodger or, or uh, conscientious objector cases, depending on your point of view. A case called Coppa Bianco versus Laird. And so I did, and drafted it, and by the time he came back, he just adopted it, didn't change a word. Well, in the summer I went to England, but, uh, but in early September, through Hen uh, Judge Friendly's uh, arrangement, I, I was off at 26 years old to the Solicitor General's office. And it was very small back then, there were maybe nine of us. Uh, Erwin Griswold was the, uh, the former Dean of Harvard, and, uh, uh, it was the Solicitor General, and we used to have these little meetings. Uh, so I arrive, and it's about two weeks into uh, my tenure there. We have a meeting about what cases to take up to the Supreme Court, and one of the deputies says, we're going to take up this Kappa Bianco versus Left the room. They did. They took it up, and the Supreme Court vacated. So, I mean, that was... <laughs> It's another example. But I did, I drafted, I, I redrafted opinions, and in fact, um, you know, I'll try to cut this short, but uh, one of my prized possessions, which I showed David when he was up there, is that uh, it was over Christmas time, and, and Judge Friendly uh, didn't come in he, uh, between Christmas and New Year. And so, but he, he wanted the draft, uh, you know, my work on a draft that he had done in a particular case uh, brought up to his apartment. So I brought it up, and he says, where's the draft? You know, and I said, actually, um, I don't have it. And he said, you don't have it? And I said, no. What I've done is re redone the opinion. I think you were wrong. And I handed it to him and, and, and then left. He said, give me that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's January 2nd or whenever it was. He comes back and he comes storming in. He always arrived at, during my years at 9 o'clock. And he'd go whizzing by. Um, uh, without much of a greeting, but he this time he, he did. He stopped at the clerk's office and he came in. And he took the pile of papers and threw it down on the desk like that. And across the top it said, I yield. And <laughs> <laughs> that, that was going to be my next question was whether you ever disagreed with Herman yeah. on, on the decision. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, I think he must have softened a bit by the time uh, we got there. We, we were allowed to write one opinion at the end of the year if we didn't screw up before that. That, that was the rule. <laughs> but uh, no illusions as to what the kind of opinion. Uh, Arissa had just come out. I was in law school. And uh, no one wanted to work on an Arissa case. But he gave me an Arissa opinion at the end of the year to work on. And uh, after, I'd say, three days, no, he did, as David said, I don't think an opinion that he wrote ever took more than one or two days, maybe three days. He just sat down, wrote, wrote, wrote. Uh, David has the example in the uh, book of, you, he'd be writing the opinion, you'd get buzzed. We didn't have intercoms, or we just had a buzzer. You would jump 
<laughs> and we would come in, and he would be standing there with, with his extra pen in his hand, still writing. And then like a nurse in an operating room, you would take out the scalpel, slap another one into his hand, he'd switch, <laughs> give it back to you, and, and he'd, he'd continue writing. And he wrote non-stop until he left. Uh, my day, he left a little bit earlier because he was catching a ride with Judge Medina, who had his own limousine, um, and uh, maybe 4.30 or 5 o'clock. And uh, he'd come back in, walk right past us, and start writing. So, as David said, his opinions took him about two days, maybe at the max, to write. I was still working on this three days to five days later, and he was getting grumpier and grumpier. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm not going to be able to get it done until the end of the week. And I, I have to go to the, Brooklyn to the Brooklyn Law School Library. That was my excuse. Um, so it turned out that ERISA was a new statute and it had transition rules. And it was clear from the transition rules that ERISA did not apply to the case at all. Uh -huh. hmm. And so I wrote for him it was really a memo rather than an opinion saying that the case doesn't, doesn't apply at all. Probably not a jurisdictional question, but it really doesn't apply. And I gave it to him. And this followed also what David said, which nobody had raised this issue at all. They had totally missed it. And I wasn't sure whether the judge would just be angry at me for raising an issue that had never been raised. And he came back out with this huge smile on his face, which I didn't expect to get in an ERISA case. And he said, ah, now I see why it took you so long. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and I said, you know, it's not jurisdictional. And he says, I know, but we shouldn't be making law in an area where blah, blah, blah. And we sent it back down. And we actually never heard of it from him. He never came back to us again. Hmm. Well, I, very similar. Uh, one thing that I think, uh, and this this is a theme that uh, is uh, found in the book in, in several respects, but it's absolutely uh, the biggest takeaway for me from my year with Judge Friendly, and that is that despite the fact that he was smarter than the rest of us by a lot, uh, he had... You know, 40 years of legal, 50 years of legal experience, um, and uh, compared to my, you know, six weeks when I uh, started, and but he was looking for whatever he could get out of the people he was interacting with, whether it was the lawyers in the case, uh, whether it was his colleagues on the bench, or whether it was us. And if he could get a good idea. It didn't matter if you had just started with him as a law clerk. If it was a good idea, great. He would grab it, he would embrace it, he would thank you for it, and it would find its way into the opinion. And that has always struck me as quite unusual among gifted people uh, who have achieved that level of accomplishment to be able to still understand that they can learn, they can incorporate, they can adapt, they can even change their mind. And that was thematic through the year. That's what I think, that's the reason the clerks did feel that they were useful, is because he made them feel useful by constantly going to them and saying, well, what about this? Well, what about that? Uh, don't you think this is a problem? And he would listen. He wasn't simply trying to coerce you into adopting his point of view. He was testing his ideas. Uh, and... Um, uh, you know, I, I, my experience was the same as, as Ray and Merrick's, which is that um, at the end of the year, he let me uh, write an opinion, and um, uh, I don't think it ever went anywhere. It was probably an opinion of insignificance that uh, exceeded the, the conscience of subjector <laughs> case, but uh, uh, it was uh, uh, really uh, an exceptional sense of responsibility despite the fact that we weren't doing the drafts. And it's hard to convey that these days to uh, clerks who do a lot of drafting. They think, well, you didn't, then, then you didn't do anything. And yet, uh, I think all of us felt that we did a lot and the judge felt that we were necessary and useful. Did you have any experience that you could remember of either disagreeing with the judge or well, um, we had several cases in which um, I'm not sure it ever got to the point of, of 
my saying, judge, you're wrong. You know, I, uh, I, there were no I yield moments uh, that I can recall anyway. But we had several cases in which uh, we had different takes on the case initially at the early stage. And um, he had doubts about his take. And uh, we ended up kind of maneuvering somewhere between where each of us was. And, uh, there was one case I remember, for example, that that um, uh, this was a, a preliminary injunction appeal, and he didn't like what the district judge had done. And um, I said, well, but you know, the standard of review, standard of review, judge, you know, this is abuse of discretion. Can you really say this is an abuse of discretion? And he said, well, so your position is the district court got everything wrong but the caption, so we affirm. <laughs> and, and we ended up affirming. Now, I don't think it was particularly because of me, but you know, I was, he was looking to me for pushback against his instinct, which is to say that uh, we ought to find a way to reverse. But ultimately, the standard of review won out. Let me add one thing. At, at least in my experience, there were uh, not many, but there were several times when uh, the panel, after the exchange of memoranda that, that David talked about, really had not come to any kind of firm conclusion in, in a case. And oftentimes, if Friendly was the, were the, was the senior judge, which he was almost always, he became chief judge the year after I clerked for him, he would take the opinion and, and, and he would, I'd talk to him after the argument, and after the memos came back in, I said, well, you know, where, where do you stand on this? He says, I don't know. And he'd start writing. I mean, and the, the writing process was, for him, a way of thinking. Unlike, uh, I think, normal human beings. I mean, Friendly was a genius. So that, there's no question about that. But, but he would write, and what he would be doing is thinking while he was writing. And you can look, if you go back to some of his old opinions, you'd find uh, the, the, he wouldn't put it this crudely, but on the one hand, on the other hand, where he'd give one side's argument, the other side's argument, and better than either side had ever put them. And I, when I see those opinions, I think to myself, this is the judge thinking. Yeah. I would say, similarly, I always thought about that as a, a certain way as consequence of not having word processors <laughs> and only having a pen and a, and a pad, and of the cost of having to redo a typed item at, in those days um, in terms of really having to start all over again basically if you did it. So his style, as I look at his opinions again, is very different than my style or any of those current judges styles I think because it is, it is a stream of consciousness. It's his thinking his way through as he's writing and sometimes it twists a little bit and it gets to the end and, and he's quite persuasive by the time you get to the end. Um, I think I think that if had he had a word processor, he could easily have cut and pasted and reorganized it. But for somebody who was, you know, knocking out an opinion every couple of days, uh, that really wasn't possible. And, and uh, I think Ray was saying everything was on carbon, even if you, even if you want to make a copy of it using carbon paper. So. I wonder something. if you have any uh, reactions to uh, David's comments about uh, judicial philosophy, politics, or sort of your perception of uh, you know, how the judge came to decisions, whether you think that that was accurate or whether you have any uh, disagreements or anything to add to the analysis of uh, his approach to cases. Well, I, this is maybe the one thing I would disagree with David about, but I'm, I wasn't sure I saw it in the book. That is, the way he put it in this in this last back and forth was that he would use any set of tools to get to the result. And I, at least in the year that I was there, I never felt that way. I just never felt that he had the result in his mind to begin with. Um, in fact, the process with us was um, you would start talking first when you, um, he would get you in, you would be scared to death. <laughs> and uh, he would say, what do you think? I think this is in the book. He'd say, what do you think? And uh, you know, the, the normal thing is to try to figure out, well, what do you think? <laughs> but that wasn't, the, that wasn't an option. Yeah. And so the conversation back and forth was a really open conversation. He would push back, he would push back. And I, I wasn't always sure what his going in position was by the time we came to the end. 
But I, I never, I didn't feel that he had in mind a result that he wanted to reach for. I would say the one thing that I really felt was a legacy that, that he left for the clerks was that this idea that you know, law is just politics by another name is not true. And I never, ever felt that he you know, was reaching a result because either polit politically in the small p or ideologically or p in the big p that it made any difference to him. He was trying to reach what he thought was you know, the right <coughs> result and that that was the, the significance. So I, may, I think in the end I would agree exactly with David's label which was a pragmatic moderate. I think that is, that is the best way to put it. But yeah. he, said, he always said he had no jurisprudent prudential theory and he didn't, I don't think. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a, entirely the reaction I had to uh, to him. Uh, he was a, ultimately an eminently sensible man. I think you know he he may not have had the breadth of experience uh, that some jurists have had, but he was remarkable in that he understood and came to sensible views of a huge range of different situations. Um, uh, and I think he viewed himself as a common lawyer uh, as having the responsibility to make the law make sense. And if that meant the law had to be used in a way that pushed one doctrine a little farther and another doctrine a little less, then you had not, not only the uh, entitlement but the obligation to have the law develop in that direction. But never did I feel that he was willful about saying, well, precedents be damned, we're going to do this because this is what I want to do. Um, he was, a, you know, what, one of the things that I, I, I think David mentioned this, the quote about the dictionary, the fortress, uh, et cetera, and, and learned hand. He wrote a, a, a wonderful essay about uh, statutory construction that, that I just read the other day, which I, I really found just marvelously refreshing, even though it's a bit dated, obviously. Uh, but it's Mr. Justice Frankfurter and the Reading of Statutes, in which he lays out something that is as close as he got to a judicial philosophy, which is essentially, when you read statutes, be sensible about it. Don't do stupid things just because somebody left a word out, but also don't sort of glance at the statute and then go running off and deciding the case on the basis of what you regard as the best policy. Uh, he, was, he would be regarded as sort of a, I think, a, a textualist of a, uh, of a sort of watered down sort, but not nearly as hardline a textualist as people who um, call themselves textualists today. So, um, do you see any influence of your time with Friendly in your own work as judges or your own career choices um, that you've made? Uh, so what, what do you see, as, looking back now, as the influence of your year clerking <coughs> on where you are now or what you've done since then? Well, I wouldn't be here but for Henry Friendly, but I guess the, my two colleagues would say this. He, there's no question that, that he uh, made all the difference in, to me anyway, because I, about, I don't know, a few months, of half, it's been so long ago, it was 19, winter of 1970, and I still remember <coughs> he came into me and said, what are you going to do next year? Said, I don't know. I said, well, I'm going to call Irwin. <laughs> and he did. He went into uh, the back into his inner office and called Dean Irwin Griswold up. Next thing I know, I'm on a train to Washington and been hired into the Solicitor General's office. As I said, I was 26 years old. Um, did that change my life? Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, and it made all the difference to me. Uh, that's how I wound up in Washington in 1970, and um, it was kind of a progression. And uh, so. As far as my personal um, situation as a judge now, like, do you ever think of how he would decide? X you know, I used to say to myself, Dean, um, I haven't done this lately. Maybe I should. 
but I'm going to try to have a Henry friendly day today. <laughs> I, I did that a lot. I, and what I meant by that is what you've heard is that I, I would go in and try not to waste one second. <laughs> because that's the way he operated. He came in at 9 o'clock and there was no small talk at all. Uh, he didn't go out to lunch very often. Maybe Judge Medina would come around, but he mostly he had a lunch of uh, this. Uh, oh no, no, it was Snappy Tom, which was some kind of a, what was that? Some kind of cocktail mix or something? Bloody Mary mix, and and some cheese and crackers. And and during lunchtime, he'd sit at this big conference table, and he'd read law reviews. So even during lunch, he was he was doing that. Um, I'm not, I was not always successful. As a matter of fact, I was very rarely successful in, in having a Henry friendly day. But the work ethic was there, and also the, being conscientious um, about the uh, about the cases that we decide. And the same thing was true um, when I was practicing law. I mean, I tried to tried to do that the same thing. Again, I wasn't very successful, but um, but anyway, that was the. The inspiration, uh, inspiration part, of, uh, that I, the thing I took away maybe most from uh, Clark and Um Yeah, I, I'd say I, on the writing I take from him uh, his famous phrase he used, which is that that doesn't write or it won't mm -hmm. write, which which was an expression of when sometimes he would start writing in a certain way and he couldn't get to the result that they had agreed on at the conference, and. I find myself that like, and again, I can't do it in any efficient way, the way he does it, did it, but I have to write the opinion out myself because I think while I'm writing. And I have the advantage now of having written it out to be able to cut it and paste it and put it back in a way that looks more elegant, but my thinking comes through my writing. And similarly, I. I hope I treat my clerks better in a certain in a certain in a, in a certain way, but I hope that with respect to the intellectual um, um, back and forth and argument, that I treat them in the same way. And and that is something he was really a gift, which was you're entitled to argue with this guy, who is way senior to you and way more well known than you and way better than you, and he is going to respect your views. You know, for the quality, for the merit of the view, and expect you to argue back to, back with him, and and that's an I say that's an important way, in every piece of the career I've had, that I get to a better result is by having a an honest intellectual exchange. Yeah, I th I, I think both uh, if you're Ray and Merrick have hit the nail on the head. I, I and my. One, the one thing I tell my clerks at the beginning of every year, and this is really resonant of what I learned from Henry Friendly, is I don't want you to think of what you think I am going to think. I want to know what you think, and I, if you don't think what I think is right, I want to know it. And it's hard to persuade these kids to do that. Uh, now, Judge Friendly knew that it was in his interest to get out of us whatever we could give him by way of pushback, and he did. And you know, the the notion that he was difficult and demanding, he was demanding in the sense that he expected a lot, but I never found him difficult in the sense that he was unfair. I thought the times that he was sharp, and there were not very many, but the times that he was sharp with me, damn it, I deserved it. <laughs> It's because I had done a slipshod job on something, or I had sort of you know, not thought th something through, and he said, well, how about this? Or, Didn't you read this and such? Or, that case seems to be right on point. At least the brief writers thought so. <laughs> Why didn't you? You know, perfectly fair. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, ex exploit the resources available to you uh, for everything they can offer is, is a great approach for a judge. Keep your mind open. Uh, do not simply decide that your instincts are infallible and therefore uh, anything you hear from anyone else is pretty much useless. That's something you would never get from Friendly and I hope you know, that I absorb that much from him. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, I get, as 
Eric said, uh, when I became a judge, um, sort of like these people that try to set up uh, rooms that look exactly like 221B Baker Street, <laughs> Sherlock Holmes fans. I tried to set up my chambers exactly the way Friendly did, and the only thing that was missing, I had everything set up. I had the tables and you know everything set up. Uh, to, to, to try to operate pretty much in the way that he operated. I decided I would treat my clerks uh, pretty much in the same way. The only thing that was missing is I wasn't Henry Friendly. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you uh, to all three of you for your thoughts. Uh, let me in, uh, uh, invite now, um, if you will uh, go back and take your seats there, I'm going to invite the other clerks who are here who would like to uh, speak a little bit about their uh, memories of Judge Friendly to come up and uh, sit here. And let's see how many we have. Why don't we start over on this side? So, introduce yourself. Yes, thank you, thank you, Dean. I'm uh, Paul Morgan. I clerked in 1980 to 81 for uh, Judge Friendly. And uh, a couple of things were interesting there is uh, the previous term uh, was, on, of course, John Roberts was one of the clerks that year. I was the next clerk from Harvard. So I don't think I benefited from the comparison to, uh, to Roberts, who was one of the judge's favorites. Uh, the other thing is he, the judge had been had, had a, uh, been ill the prior year, so he spent quite a bit of time in the hospital, and but still carried on the full workload, uh, and had, had left it to the to the clerks, giving the clerks more role in writing opinions, but again keeping the facts for himself. The other thing that that happened was that uh, three of his cases went to the, were. Uh, cert was granted in three of his cases from the prior term. So these were pending when I started in the summer of 1980. And uh, one was a hydro level case, a case about civil liability. Another was about whether there was a private cause of action under the Commodities Exchange Act. And the third was about a stop against the government, uh, uh, Schweiker versus Hansen. Uh, and it turned out that friendly. Uh, position prevailed in all three in the Supreme Court, even though he was he was certainly reversed in other cases. Uh, so in the, in the Schweiker v. Hansen case involved a woman who had asked for, who was uh, not substantively eligible for government benefits, but purportedly had a right to them because of what she'd been told in a conversation with a government worker. So for the majority in the Second Circuit, that was enough. But Friendly wrote a big dissent saying you, you can't have a stop against the government when. You're talking about government benefits, and that that position prevailed. So Judge Oak's opinion was was reversed. We had another case then, where very briefly, where the issue was when you have a large container that's put on a ship, is the uh, the package the, the the big container, the giant container, or is it each box within the uh, the container? Because a shipper's liability is limited by statute to $500. For a package, so this came up. Judge Oaks had a, had a prior opinion that said that the the test was was it in the original package, uh, so that if the person shipping some merchandise, let's say from New Hampshire, had loaded the container in New Hampshire, well then the whole container was was would be the package because it was in the original package when it got on the ship. And so Judge, this was somewhat inconsistent with an old friendly opinion. And Judge Feinberg had also criticized this. So we get a case. Same issue arises in the panel is Oaks, Friendly, and, and Feinberg. So Judge Friendly was really looking at his chops for, for this case. And sure enough, he, he, he overruled the, the other case uh, with Judge Oaks going along. And when, when in addition, Schweiker v. Hansen was reversed, which Judge Oaks had written. So he sent a note over saying that he had to eat crow twice in one term. But he was a wonderful <laughs> judge as well. We're going down the line. Yeah. Um, well, I, first, I guess just because we all had different experiences, yeah. I suppose, I, I would somewhat disagree with David's characterization of the judge as being, I won't say joyless, but not really joie de vivre. He, he really was in so many old-fashioned German-Jewish New York ways, quite the man. He belonged to the Harmony Club. He went to the Council on Foreign Relations. He would take us to the Merchant Club, and Mervis would tell him the latest intricacies in a business uh, case we had. Uh, he loved going through France with Sophie. And actually, somebody should, as a sequel to the book, publish Sophie's itineraries for the French 
uh, Loire Valley uh, uh, escapades that they had. Um, so I, I think in, in, in it, he was doer, to be sure, as an employer. You didn't mess with him. You didn't go in there and say, how you doing, boss? Uh, he was spoken spoken to. But, but I do think that he really had a very nice domestic routine that he enjoyed. I think, frankly, however, dare I say, and now that I've read bits of it in David's book, I think it shows the point, he might have been happier as a historian because his, the prose that's excerpted in the book from his undergraduate essays is extraordinary. Um, I think he felt frustrated at being an interstitial judge, particularly as he got older. He sort of knew the best he was going to get from it was a, a pat on the head from a Supreme Court justice and an opinion. And he realized, I think, that most Second Circuit cases were very fact-bound and mattered to the parties. And he did justice by the parties, but probably weren't going to have a uh, huge impact on jurisprudence. But the one thing he was really very good at, well, many things, but one of the uh, key things, I think, was the cinematographic uh, tour of the horizon of where the law had been, where it had gotten to, where it was now, and where this new set of facts would fit in. So in that sense, the, the magisterial uh, narrative voice uh, that uh, was so characteristic of his opinions was something I think he, he took from history and from McElwain and from his love of English constitutional history. As an employer, tough guy, um, the woman question, which I had raised once with the dean, um, he hadn't had a female clerk before. I think I probably got the job because he'd taken the executive editor of the Yellow Journal before me and Weiner after me, uh, and my new Martin Frankel. But I, I think in his day and age, females had a different scene and a different category. His, um, his, his wife, Sophie, wasn't particularly keen on his having female clerks, I, I think. Uh, but, but working for him, I have to say, it was as pleasant in a certain constrained way <laughs> an experience as I've ever had. I think he, he was all intellect. So there was absolutely no uh, sense of being different or odd. Or he, he loved the Jewish Judges Luncheon Club also, I should say. He was very much a German Jew. And Sam Silverman and Marvin Frankel and and Wilfred was admitted later after the dust up over how he got his appointment to the Second Circuit had died down. Uh, but he loved cavorting with these guys. It, it was a very, very uh, I think, gemütlich uh, courthouse in, in, in that sense. And, and finally, just on jurisprudence, um, he did have a sense always that Congress messed things up and didn't know how to draft. So though he took the statutes seriously, he also understood that this was done in a hurry. He wasn't quite filio, but almost. And therefore, I looked for the logic of the uh, opinions. He taught me to be a fact lawyer, really did. The facts really mattered in, in a way that I didn't appreciate till I became a prosecutor and a trial lawyer. But to him, uh, perhaps because of his practice, the facts really, really did uh, matter. He loved new discoveries. But my favorite case was just a, who, who cares, but a, a, a derivative copyright case involving Madame Butterfly in a, in a, in a prior novel. And the question was whether it, when the second term of the copyright uh, begins, because it's been acquired by the, the, the uh, spawn of the, of the writer, could the new copyright that the heir receives be used to hold up the continued use of a derivative work? So it was the issue of whether Madame Butterfly could be, whether the libretto could be any, any longer be uh, paid without a a kind of a shakedown price uh, because of the, uh, the uh, successor's uh, uh, original copyright. And I, I, I went off to, for first he loved to pull, he loved to pull uh, folders from Bayonne from the federal archives. He could distinguish any case if he wanted to based on the facts. And then when I found the 1909 Copyright Act legislative history had just been published, and sent my beloved husband to go get it at the publishers, hot off the press, and stayed up all night till about five o'clock in the morning, no index, looking for any paragraph that would deal with this case, and found it at about five o'clock in the morning, and wrote a memo and came in and put it under his door, and he said, glad to see you're doing a little hard work, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he was a demanding employer, but he was a wonderful judge, and down deep, I think, a wonderful human being. And, and final, final point, since uh, Rob and I both went to the Yale Law School where I think the law is not considered itself a real metier. You have to impose some other discipline on it. Friendly really believed... 
<laughs> not now. Uh, but Friendly really believed, a la Lord Cook, that law was, he wouldn't put it this way, but an artificial science. That to be deeply read in the law, in all of its specialties and, and aspects, gave you just a very different sense of judgment and symmetry and logic and gemuklichkeit, you may just, what, what, what is seemly and comely. So I think he's one of the very few people I know who really understood that you had to have this, this resonant sense of where the law had been and where, therefore, it might go. I have a smooth question for those of you who didn't know. Would you, you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Bill Lake, I was a clerk in the 68 to 69 term. And to pick up and illustrate one of the thoughts David expressed, and which I think come beautifully through the book, is I think Judge Friendly was a judicial activist not in the sense of someone pursuing a liberal or a conservative political agenda, not in the least, but he was an activist in the service of the law. He saw one of his great satisfactions as being straightening out tangles that other judges had gotten themselves into in the law, uh, and as people have said, reaching just a practical right result in a case. And uh, that's why he loved dicta. I think he saw each case, particularly the interesting ones, as an opportunity to irrigate this little area of the law with my wisdom. And he would irrigate it you know, well beyond the facts of the case, always brilliantly. Um, and one little illustration of that is early in my clerkship, there was a case that had been argued. He would assigned himself the opinion. He was in there writing. And I did a little digging and discovered that it was an interlocutory appeal. And we didn't have jurisdiction because it hadn't been properly certified by the district judge. I don't even remember the rule. You probably know it. Um, so I went in and told him that. And he was delighted. He was so excited. He, woke, he sent one of his little notes around to the other judges saying, my law clerk has found this. Da, 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 we got rid of the case. Um, fast forward about six months, there was another case that he was really itching to decide. And I discovered that it had the same defect. And he said, we just won't raise it this time. <laughs> so he decided the case, and I'm sure it's one of his more brilliant opinions. Um, the, one of the great satisfactions and scary moments that we all had was when he'd given you a draft of the opinion, you'd done some editing on it, and you took it in to have him look at your edits. And he would sit there sort of page after page, and if you were lucky, he would take you know, maybe a third of what you'd done. Um, and one particular day, this sort of illustrates, he did have a lovely sense of humor. When I'd done better than my usual batting average, and he sat it down and said, good work, Bill, he said, this reminds me of Judge Jerome Frank, who was an earlier Second Circuit judge, who regarded by many as a brilliant judge, but a very prolific writer. He would write these long, rather, rather badly organized, sort of stream of consciousness opinions. And according to Judge Friendly, he said one of his law clerks took one of his drafts once, and it was 100 pages, and the clerk spent days boiling it down, putting in headings, moving things around, came back with a beautifully, tightly argued 20-page draft, and took it into Judge Frank and sat there and watched, and as the judge turned each page, his smile got bigger and bigger, and at the end, he put it down and said, this is terrific, we'll tack it on at the end. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Rob Weiner, I cooked 77, 78 with Derek, and uh, it, was, it was a great year, it's really probably the most educational year of my legal career. And the judge was, in fact, a demanding employer. And he's been referred to as grumpy. You know, he, he would growl on the table, but never more than once. And he didn't keep harping on something. And when he was upset, it was usually about some administrative detail. He couldn't see that well. In the clerks, and I don't know whether this had grown up because it was, and this is just sort of a tradition that had grown up, but we had a chart of where everything was supposed to be when he went on the bench. If the briefs were here, and the paper clips were there, and it was drawn out. We had a clerk's manual. Um, and also, we, we wanted a correspondence of this desk when he came in the morning. And everything had to be in a certain place. If you got that wrong, that's when he would be unhappy. Um, but he was he was grandfatherly in his in his way too. Uh, I recall uh, during that year, my wife had a miscarriage, and I was really uh, touched by the concern uh, that he expressed, which was really um, 
he didn't he didn't often express it, but um, in that occasion, it was clear that he really did care about the, the welfare of his clerks, and he really was delighted if you found something that he didn't find. find. Um, when I started, I, I, like everyone else, I remember walking in, uh, into his chambers and be there looking, looking something up, and when he was writing, if he wanted to sign a case, he would just get up and pull the money and get it open it to the right page. He, he just remembered the citations, and that's the kind of memory he had. Well, when I started, we had a, a case, and um, I was um, manically trying to uh, get the judges to make a good first impression. And the record wasn't that big. I think I read it eight times. And I basically had it memorized. Um, not because I had the memory, kind of memory he did, but because I read it eight times uh, and found something in there that uh, was uh, a way to, to dispose of the case. And he was delighted. And, uh, and so I put that in the draft. And then he called me in, buzzed me in, and said, well, this is, he was really happy. Where in the, where in the transcript does it say X? And I said, you know, page 54, because I had it all memorized. And has raised his eyebrow and you know, kept on writing. I went out. He buzzed me in again 10 minutes later. Where in the transcript does it say why? And I had, remember, he did it four times until I finally didn't get it right. <laughs> <laughs> and then he smiled and he said, Go look it up. <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, you know, he, he was trying to figure out whether I could do what, what, uh, what he did. He found out very quickly. He couldn't, uh, but he really was looking for um, success on the part of his law clerks. And in that case, any other time when you found something, he would, in the notes to the other judge, he would identify this as something my law clerk came up with, this is uh, something that, that we missed, the parties missed, or that, that we got wrong. He would always uh, give uh, credit uh, to us. And as a result, we, um, we lived for his praise. I mean, he got everything out of us he could possibly get. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dalton Rosen, and I was the uh, clerk of the 1959 60 term. Uh, I have to say that I am totally in awe of uh, the incredible, meticulous detail the first that they did with the book. Uh, I learned so much about uh, the Turner's uh, life and work that I had not known that as a consequence of, the, of David's extraordinary work. Now, I was particularly interested in uh, the reasons I'll explain in the uh, account that uh, they gave of the uh, complex confirmation process that uh, so they had to go through the, the extremely involved uh, dealing with uh, New York and uh, Connecticut and Senate politics. I want you all to read the book, so I'm not going to uh, uh, provide the spoiler, but uh, I mean, uh, the story has a rather amazing resolution. Uh, this is all of interest to me because uh, back in the uh, summer of 1959, I was uh, home in Baltimore sitting around waiting for uh, to be sure that I had a job in the uh, fall of uh, 1960. And I guess I was sustained by the, uh, by the great faith that, that it just was not possible. And that, and that, Judge that a person of you know, extraordinary, extraordinary talents and accomplishments would not be confirmed by the Senate and put into that job. Um, I, I can't help thinking about the Saturday, but I'm, I'm not sure that a, a law graduate in, in the spring of 2013 uh, might have that same uh, confident uh, feeling that the, that the process was going to work. <laughs> Uh, I think the last thing I can say is that uh, I was there uh, on the Monmessence Day when uh, Judge Friendly decided that the 
down in the head of stage and it was time to move on to the ballpoint. <laughs> I came, I worked uh, for the judge in uh, 1970 to 71. Um, the, you know, my co driver was, was Robert Ellis King, who we mentioned before. I, I guess I'm struck by the consistency uh, of experience of all the clerks who have spoken, uh, spoken here today. Um, uh, I think the point you made about the judge's concern to have an absolute mastery of the facts and the record of the case is the main thing that, that I took away from my year of clerkship. Uh, in law school, you had very little sense of the importance of, of the facts and the record. Um, and then having this experience with the judge who mastered it, uh, and I didn't know about this point back then, but I, I was always amazed at how much detail he knew about each case and always thought of it as the reason why the other judges on the panel were kind of afraid to cross him because they, they never had that mastery of it. Um, I think maybe, and I had the same experience in terms of how he worked, that is, he, he first sat down and he wrote out the facts and the record part very carefully, in great detail. And it may very well be that he, that's in part doing that led him to his conclusions about where this case should come out. I don't know that he had a philosophical predilection at the beginning as to how it should come out. But I think as he went through writing down the facts and setting it out, it pointed him in a direction as to where this, where this case should go Maybe made it easier to then deal with the law, make it up if necessary, uh, what it made, uh, but get to the end result. The other thing that struck me is that I'm glad to hear that all the other clerks like me, maybe not the same century as, as, as in my case, were an absolute terror of his intellect the whole time that they clerked for him. Um, I guess the flip side of that is that we kind of hungered for some sort of indication of praise or recognition for, for what we were doing. I remember one instance of the, of the year of my clerkship I had submitted to the Harvard Law Review, my third year law school paper, um, with some revisions in the form of an article. Uh, and the judge always, the day the Harvard Law Review came, he brought it in, he sat down, and you know, he immediately started looking through it first thing. Well, during about the middle of that year, my, my article was accepted and appeared in an issue of the Harvard Law Review as the first, I was so proud, on the cover page, the first article, the lead article, the law review. The judge got the thing and he called me in and he kind of, you see, he thought, he thought a lot of the law review. And he kind of, he looked at me and he gave me, he had a, Kind of an odd smile when he wanted to do it. I don't know how to describe it except that he looked like he was getting set to laugh but stop before he actually laughed again. In fact, he gave me a congratulations and a nod that I, 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 I finally done something here that he really could recognize. And I have to say, up to that point, to high school, college, law school, I'd actually, you know, received a lot of recognition and honors for intellectual attainment or something. Nothing before and nothing since has ever kind of stroked my intellectual ego as much as the judges kind of seeing my Harvard Law Review article on his desk that moment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate this. Uh, I think we're going to have time for a few questions to take the So maybe one of the back up yeah, On that uh, Pentagon Papers thing, <clears throat> the two. Your brother was a former clerk of Justice Harlan. Correct. Talk to him about the. Uh, I didn't see any mention of him. Did ask him about it and find out for him. Well, uh, uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, I'll repeat The question is my, my brother, who's a professor at NYU Law School, a clerk for Harlan, whether I talked to him about it. Actually, I'm not sure, because he didn't clerk that year. He clerked much earlier, and 
I know, no, I think he, he had the opportunity because he read the manuscript to say, did you look here, did you look there? Uh, but I really didn't get any input. He helped you. He'd been a former clerk of Harlan Tractor, but the question was whether Friendly wanted to stay, the Supreme Court to stay, the Second Circuit decision on the Pentagon papers. Well, um, I think that Judge Friendly, uh, I think Judge Harlan saw the same way on the case, but um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure, and I think Judge Friendly thought who thought a lot of Harlan, obviously also thought that Harlan could use some help. <laughs> <laughs> well, Harlan uh, swore him in as a judge of the Second Circuit. Right. They were they were very very close, and I think Friendly may have felt he if he sent it. I you know he may, I don't I don't know what happened. I think Judge Randolph has a thought. I worked on the Pentagon Papers in the Solicitor General's office. I doubt was, I doubt that Judge Friendly sent anything because if you recall. Uh, the Supreme Court granted certiorari on a Friday morning. Our brief was due 10 o'clock Saturday. And then the case was argued immediately. So the time and, and it was decided in a flash. So putting something in the mail certainly wouldn't have gotten to Harlan in time. And, and the other thing is that if you found no evidence among Harlan's first, Harlan by that time, I met with him, that it couldn't read. He, he was almost legally blind. And he had special typewriters in his chambers with gigantic print on them. And he had, even that, he had to hold up to, 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 to even read it. So I think it's very unlikely that the, that the law clerks would, would not know because somebody had to read re and all the rest of Well, you, you raised something that is probably the answer, maybe the answer is, and that is it just didn't get there in time, if it was sense. Yep. There's no email. <laughs> but it was, I, I, I didn't think of that, but you know, everything you said is absolutely right. Yes. The question about his, his pre-judicial years, uh, if, if you talked about how you've been recruited to the Harvard Law School faculty a few times and turned that down for fairly financial considerations, but I thought it was curious that a, a, a legal talent of this degree would be focusing on CAB cases as opposed to being a you know, great litigator in the tradition of John Davis or, or attracted to a revolving door and, and, and public service. So I guess kind of a two part question. One, did you get a sense that he felt like he was living up to his intellectual promise as, a, as an attorney in, in these administrative cases? And the second part of that question is you know, in the latter half of his judicial service, uh, the airline industry in general was in, in for a, you know, quite a, a, an over. It was uh, uh, changed dramatically. Do you get a sense that he reflected all on the social utility of the regulatory framework that was upended in the 1970s uh, that he was participating in? The okay, let me answer the second one first. Judge Friendly was always against deregulation. Felt very strongly that it was a very, very bad idea. And uh, even at one of the clerk's dinners, I was told. Uh, someone asked him a question, and he just said that was a terrible decision, and uh, I thought the regulation was very, very bad for the airline industry and the country, despite his various criticisms, and they were very severe of the CAV. On the first point is I think that private practitioners don't really have the choice that your question sort of assumes. No, he's with a firm. Uh, to, to year or two out of uh, clerking for Brandeis, they asked him to work on a, a CAB matter. Well, actually, it wasn't a CAB then, on a root matter, because in the early years, it was all bilateral. It wasn't until, I think, 1938 that there was this kind of regulation, and actually, friendly helped draft the regulation, the statute, for Congress with a few other people. And it was the industry, actually, that wanted it regulation as opposed to a situation where they didn't want it. So I think that Judge Friendly was working there two, three years out of law school, they give him some cases. He's not going to say, well, what would uh, John Davis do with this? Uh, or how do I get to represent a, a you know, flag burning case or something like that? You just do it. And as time went on, he became more and more identified with Pan American. He had other clients. 
and uh, you won't be, well, shocked to learn that they were somewhat similar to Pan American. He represented the New York Telephone Company in rape cases. So his diet of practicing law was, you're right, not terribly exciting. But that's the way it is, and you know, he's, he's one of the pillars of the firm, you know, keeping these clients happy, that they really had no choice. He also did, was very interested in the real reorganization cases when he went on the bench. He spent a lot of time on that. He probably didn't have to do that, did he? I mean, he could have gotten off of that. Well, he loved, yeah, that's another subject entirely, which is an interesting one. For Henry Fredley loved railroads for whatever reason, uh, maybe from being from Elmira, New York, uh, had something to do with it. And when he was working in uh, Root Clark in the 1930s, he did a lot of railroad bankruptcy work. That was another important part of his work. So he did know bankruptcy law. And then he had some railroad cases early on in his career as a judge. And then when the freight railroads collapsed in the mid-1970s and Congress passed, I guess it was the Regional Railroad Reorganization Act, which called for a three-judge court, he was the natural person to be the chief judge and steered that through, uh, I thought, what I've read and talked to people who participated uh, very successfully. So um, railroads were all another major part of his career along with airplanes and telephones and things like that. He was a regulatory lawyer before there really was such a thing as a regulatory lawyer. Okay. Just say one thing about the Pan Am stuff. Think about what it was like at the time, not about what airline regulation became later. This was really, the, in a sense, the frontier. This was the Wild West. He was creating. Uh, Lindbergh was one of the employees who he was working with. Because they, you know, they were, that's how Pan Am was created. And they got these routes to South America. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what would happen. Maybe it was like Silicon Valley when Silicon Valley began. This was the beginning of the early. It was a lot more exciting than it sounds in retrospect. Well, that's a very good point. I think for the first half of Judge Friendly's career, it was a little bit like the Wild West. I mean, Friendly said he rushed, he had to rush down to Cuba to sign up a, a flight on a bilateral basis, and there were investigations by Senator Black, who was accusing the uh, Pan American of undercutting competition by getting private, making private deals behind the back of everyone else. And Friendly's reaction was, I'm glad he saw that we were doing our job. <laughs> and uh, that was Hugo Black. Yeah, it was Hugo Black. And, uh, and Truman also was a critic of Pan American. Pan American was not a very popular entity. But at the beginning, as I said, they were bilateral deals. The way you got a flight uh, from uh, route from Miami to Havana was you got uh, you went down and signed something up with Havana to be the exclusive or whatever, and it was only when you got really to post-war uh, that it became somewhat routinized with these long, difficult, slightly the you know, warring because of the you know, pettiness and the incompetence. I and mean, the lawyers were good. I think the lawyers were very good, which is another reason friendly sort of stimulated by it for a while, but the uh, commissioners were not uh, looking favorably on the result, and I think eventually finally said, uh, I've had enough of this, how do I, where do I go for another job? Well, even after he retired, he was able to, I think, take advantage of three flights on the Yes. Which was really quite he, uh, he, he took a lot of freebies, and in fact, the children sort of resented a little bit because the, Sophie, his wife, was very much of a populist, and they sort of sided with her that they shouldn't have to fly first class just because their father had worked with Pan Americans for many, many, many years. I mean, there were all these interesting little side issues. That well, uh, I think the time has come to. Uh, Thank David and everybody else. Uh, a couple of important words. First, uh, we're about to have a reception, which is sponsored by Clary Gottlieb, Nina Hamilton, uh, former, former Judge Friendly, and the Washington officer. We want to thank him very much for it.
here in the back of the back of the room. And in addition, there are some books up here. For those of you who haven't obtained them, you can purchase them. Uh, David and I think uh, Kit Kretz from, from Clary has some, some that you can sell. So I think the price is. Yeah. And, and, and of course, David will sign them, right? Yes, absolutely. Can't forget it. Okay, my, I'm selling mine for twenty-five dollars. I don't know. I don't know what Cleary paid. <laughs> or what one trip would pay? Okay. 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 So thank you, David, for a great book.